host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. It is Saturday, January 21st, 2023, and I'm here with one of my teachers who needs no introduction, Professor James Small. Hotep, brother, how you doing today, Professor Small? Can you hear me, Professor Small? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I, I, how you doing today, Small? brother? Everything is going good, Brother Michael. It's good to be with one of the great network historians. <laughs> okay. Because I was explaining to you earlier today, you, you right. are a, let me see the best, the best term for it. Um, when you're uh, not a reporter, that's not a good word. You're a journalist. I'm in media. You're, no, you're, you're a journalistic historian. And one journalistic of historian. Journalistic okay. historian. And, All right, I'll and, take that. <laughs> so I just um, love you. Love you, love you. Love you too. <laughs> Thank and, um, you. <laughs> we're 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 on. So uh, I was yeah. trying to get some other people to listen to us so they could they can work it out. I've given them what they needed. Oh yeah, they're gonna they, they, uh, people gonna we're gonna rebroadcast this also, so people gonna see this. Okay, <laughs> and this yes. would be also an audio podcast uh, format. All right, okay. um, so uh, everybody, we're going to discuss today. Uh, a few different topics. Number one, uh, Professor uh, Jane Small uh, on February 4th, 2023 is going to be in New York City for the Hapi Day of Black Excellence. Uh, we had Brother Taiki Grant on uh, the show a couple of Sundays ago uh, to discuss this. And then also, uh, I posted an article a few days ago from okafrica.com that deals with a new documentary series uh, from executive producer Jada Pinkett Smith, and it's from uh, the uh, her her production company, uh, her and Will Smith's uh, production company. And this uh, series is called African Queens, African Queens, and wow. it's a uh, documentary series that uh, is going to be on Netflix, and it debuts February fifteenth, twenty twenty three. Mm -hmm. And the first installment deals with Queen Njinga, or who we know as Nzinga. Uh, and Professor Jane Small is involved in that project. We're going to have let him talk about that as well. And then also we're going to talk about Godfather of Harlem season three, which debuted uh, Sunday, January 15th, 2023. My favorite show, Godfather of Harlem. I watched it. Fantastic episode. Professor Jane Small is the historical consultant on that show. So share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. We're going to have a fantastic conversation. All right. So, um, Professor Small, um, a lot of people have been talking about the uh, we're going to come to the happy day of excellence here shortly. But a lot of people have been talking about the um, African Queens documentary mm -hmm. series. I posted an article on January 18th, 2023 from OKAfrica.com on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. It got over a thousand likes. It got a lot of comments. People were excited about this. Tell us more about this documentary series, please. Well, my involvement in, I found out about this documentary through one of my goddaughters. Okay. And I'll just give her African name, Nane. She's Nigerian. She was yes. also the UK ambassador and high commission to Mozambique, uh, the first African to hold such a post. Um, but she's an extraordinary screenwriter. Okay. And she and her brother have their own brothers have their own production company out of Nigeria. Um, and of course the company works both in, in this hemisphere and, and Africa. Right. And Nane introduced me through one of her writing comrades. And then through that, I got introduced to sister Jada Pinkett's people who was handling this concept. And what we wanted to do was to say, okay, go to the people that know the history and know the culture on the deep side and to have a nigerian writer is not only an extraordinary sh screenwriter but it's also the ambassador and the high commission from the uk to mozambique you don't get no better than that right well right, right and so once we me and nane had the meeting and her sister we introduced another one of my goddaughters you know i'm a yoruba priest by practice yes um in that traditional system so the people who are our students that's who we're calling our goddaughters so okay. people understand what i mean when i say goddaughter 
And so this other goddaughter is Queen Giambi, who happens to be the king of the Congo. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Queen Diambi is the king of the Luba people of Southeast Congo. She's the queen of the Luba people of Southeast Congo, but she's the king of the entire Congo. King so that, the you know, the Congo. discussion of we don't have woman kings, well, go back to ancient Egypt, Hatshepsut was a woman king. Right. right. You know, and there were women exactly. king in Kemet before Hatshepsut. Correct. So the woman king is in the tradition of Africa from its very inception of, of that type of government structuring. And so in Zynga, I mean, and, 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 and Diambi, who now holds the kingship of the Congo, is really sitting on the throne of Nzinga. Because you see, in the days of Nzinga, there was no Congo-Angola boundaries. Right. We like to say she was in Angola. But yes, that part of the con the continent that is now calling Angola was her seat, but she governed much of what is also today Congo. Yes. You understand? And so Nzinga with uh, Nane and Nzinga became intricately involved in the project. And I remember one meeting we had when, when Diambi was uh, describing the role of the the king queen. Well, she's not a king queen. She's simply the king, the female the king. king, right? Right. And 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 one of the things she made clear to the producers from Sister Jada's company was that in Africa, the woman is viewed as the power, the holder of the power. Mm -hmm. The man is the carrier of the authority, which is granted by the holder of the power. When you understand that concept, you understand African culture without hesitation. And you take that back to <clears throat> ancient Nile Valley, one of the oldest civilization records that's easy for us to access. And you see um, the uh, Aset. Yes. And if you look on top of her head, her symbol is the throne. Correct. But most people don't pay attention to that. They don't look on her head. She carries right. the throne on her head. And mm -hmm. in her lap is Heru. Right. And if you look at her posture, she is in that posture, a chair, a throne. So Heru is sitting on her lap, but he's sitting on the throne of the universe, which is symbolized by his yes. mother, Aset. So even in the earliest mm -hmm. time, we are talking about the woman king. Right. She's not, not sitting on the throne. She is the throne. Right, right. Which is when basically what her name means. means. Yeah. Right. She is strong. And, yes. And the Ambi gave a wonderful lecture that day, but she's going to, you're going to meet my daughter. She is in the the documentary. Okay. And she will be doing commentary. And you will find that she's an extraordinary scholar. She's also a PhD scholar as well, and a priest right. from the Yoruba tradition as well. Grew up in uh, Kinshasa, Congo, and did part of her schooling here in America. I met her at age 16 when she was my student. Um, okay. I'm not gonna say her age, but that's a few years. <laughs> <laughs> we right. went together, I'm her tattoo. Tattoo means her father because her father of birth gave her to me to be her spiritual father. So in that sense, I am tattoo. And so that's the, the, my involvement was to enhance the involvement of two of my most extraordinary students. Okay. And those two women, uh, I think what they've added to the project was just absolutely extraordinary. You know, the first one they, finished was the one on Cleopatra. Okay. But this one will be rolled out as the first in the series. Right. Because right. I think Nzinga is so significant and the knowledge and the commentary coming in around her is so historically profound. You've got to begin with her. Right. And 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 when you remember when we had the discussion about the woman king of Dahomey. Mm-hmm. 
uh, you know, people didn't know that we had kings who were women. Exactly. And, and people were making all kinds of comments. Right. We don't call them silly. They were just uninformed. Correct. Well, yeah. once you get into our history we and our know. culture, oh yeah. my God, mm -hmm. the powerful African women kings through the centuries, the numbers are extraordinary. It will surprise most of us. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, so and Zynga reigned for such a long period of time. Right. That she had an enormous impact on the resistance movement. She had enormous impact on trying to abrogate the the relationship between the Portuguese invaders and break the hole that was called the transatlantic slave trade, which is really the transatlantic slave trade genocide program, not right. work program, but genocide program. And we should never again mention transatlantic slave trade without adding the genocide part to it. Correct. There's Correct. already some people saying, oh, and Zynga was an enslaver. She sold her people into slavery. Well, right. when you study history and the politics and the diplomacy of war, a lot of things go on, but every content you can raise has a context. And all content with context have intent. Her intent was to destroy the Portuguese hold on her people, which was there before she came to that throne. Exactly, because that's something I want to come to uh, in dealing with this. I, I looked at a, a few different articles um, dealing with this documentary series. The series looks fantastic. You know, those are types of mm -hmm. things I'm into. That's the type of media I'm into. I looked at some of the uh, comments in uh, especially one uh, that was posted on yahoo.com. I could tell the person uh, thought they knew history, but really didn't know history by the criticisms they made of, right. of, of Queen and Zynga. But let me um, uh, let me just give a brief synopsis here. Now, this is an from shadow and act uh, com picked up by yahoo.com about this documentary series African Queens exclusive Netflix reveals first uh, first look clip and premiere date for Jada Pitt Smith produced series. Now, this article is from January 18th, 2023 by Bray Williams uh, for Shadow and Act. Uh, a new docuseries uh, is coming is coming to Netflix that is executive produced as well as narrated by Jada Pinkett Smith. Now, African Queens is a new uh, documentary series exploring the lives of prominent and iconic uh, African queens. The first season will cover the life of Njinga, who we normally know as Nzinga, but uh, Njinga, uh, the complex, captivating, and fearless 17th century warrior queen of uh, uh, Ndongo. Is it Dongo or Ndongo? I hear mm -hmm. both ways. You almost swallowed the N. <laughs> yeah, Dongo, your N is pretty much silent. Dongo. Mm -hmm and Matamba in modern day Angola. Uh, the nation's first female ruler in Jenga earned a reputation for her blend of political and diplomatic skill with military prowess and became a iconic, a, a icon of resistance. So, um, it, so the, the, uh, it, it combines, uh, uh, dramatizations with uh the documentary with historical accounts things like this so let, let me ask this question since since you interjected this um if you could just give us a little background information on who queen and zynga was and when she comes to power hmm. you, you're gonna beat me on my historical notes michael well, it's, it's okay. So she becomes a queen 1626, right? And we know, uh, so this is before it's the uh, nation of Angola. You right. have- you There have, is no Angola at this right. time. There is no Congo right. at this time. The Portuguese lands in this part of Africa, really in the early, what, 1400s? The, um, uh, Portuguese, yeah. Well, uh, about so the Portuguese uh getting involved in the transatlantic slave trade 1441, uh right. going to Mauritania, uh, Mauritania and Tom Gonzalez. We know but it's they've, uh, they've already landed on the coast on the west. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 yeah. That's Columbus right. is involved in 1482, uh, right. sailing up and down the west coast of Africa. Right. He's at Columbus is actually involved working in the building of mm -hmm. Elmina Slave Dungeon, which now lies in the country of Ghana. Right. He was working on his father-in-law's ship at the time. Mm -hmm. And so the very young man that would be the navigator on Columbus ship comes from that location. So the relationship in the beginning wasn't as antagonistic as it would become once they yeah. get involved in the genocide of slavery. So by, by the early 1500s, you have the Portuguese already beginning to bring military forces into the area we now call Congo, Angola. Right. Okay. And it's early, and they are already involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Right. You know, with the bulk of their population going to Brazil at that time. Um, and so the Portuguese would have an encounter with a number of leaders before they encountered this family, because it's a dynasty that fights against uh, the Portuguese. Um, right. There is the, the king before Nzinga, there's Nzinga's brother. Mm -hmm. um, and so by the time we get to the queen Nzinga, the slave trade is already fully enforced in right. what we would now call Southern Angola, and that would be Northern Angola and Southwestern Congo. And this is what she has to confront, a Portuguese army, at that time, one of the wealthiest nations in the world because of the slave trade and has one of the most formidable, and it's such a small country, but it has a formidable Navy, it has a formidable army, and it has invaded your land with a new technology called a gun. Right. Okay, th this is what she's up against. We don't, we, don't, we, we don't think of it. We have no guns. Correct. We do not have gun technology in this part of Africa at all. Yeah. Right. We do not have genocidal warfare as a way of solving problems. That's a European method of solving problems. Genocidal warfare, we kill hundreds and thousands of people to settle a border dispute, to settle uh, some other kind of uh, dispute that happens between two groups of people or a nation. That's not the way things happen in Africa. And most times you would send your heroes out to spar, to fight. Right. And whichever side's hero wins, that side wins. Uh, there wasn't standing army that carried out genocide. We would have to build them after encountering the West and then learn over centuries how to use them appropriately, which I don't think we still have done, we haven't done to this day. Right. Um, but Nzinga comes in the midst of the Portuguese empire becoming an empire based on the enslavement of Africans from the Congo and Angola in terms of numbers. They're beginning to bring Africans from the East Coast, but those numbers are small, Madagascar, the Swahili states. The, the big prize comes with the number of labor they're able to grab in the Congo. And there was something else that people need to know. The Congos has the, what we call the Christian cross. Right. The Christian cross is also a symbol of a Congolese deity okay, in their pantheon of, 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 of deities, like the Yorubas have the Orishas. Mm -hmm. Well, all African systems have those types of pantheons. And one of the most powerful ones has a cross. And that's not unusual because you find the cross long thousands of years before Christianity in the tombs right. of Egypt. So we know it's an African symbol. And right. so many thought the Portuguese to be an adherent to their system, to one of their deities, because the symbol they carried was that symbol. The cross. So that may seem like a little thing, but in African culture, which is based on spiritual sacred science, that's not a little thing. Correct. That is cause for relationship. Right. By the time you figure out the toxicity in the relationship, you're in trouble militarily. And that's right. what we found ourselves. And I don't want to sound too philosophical, but no, people don't really understand what happens when someone comes knocking on your door and what starts out to be a promoted trade mission, really a place where we can get fresh water and we can get fresh food 
and fruits to get rid of the scurvy, which was what happened on the ships without the vitamin C's and the fruits, as we tried to circumvent this land because the Portuguese was on a mission not right. to enslave Africans. They were trying to get to Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. Why? The Portuguese is a Christian nation. The Crusades had been crushed by the rising Muslim nations. Right. And they heard that there was a Christian kingdom to the south of the Muslim nation. And it had a king called Prester John. Right. And this was Ethiopia that they're talking about. Mm-hmm. And so the Portuguese is trying to get to the Ethiopia to outflank the Muslims who have seized control of the Eastern Mediterranean, right? On both sides of the Mediterranean, both Africa and Europe. So Portugal is trying to be the hero right. for the newly formed church called the Catholic Church, a church which is formed 500 years after the Ethiopian church, by the way. Mm-hmm. And a thousand, and then the Protestant churches, which is now inundated Europe, um, which comes in the 1500s with Luther Reformation, is a thousand years younger than the Ethiopian church. So mm-hmm. they really think if we could get to the Ethiopian church, we can outflank the Muslims, we can take the Holy Land back. That's the mission the Portuguese is on when they bumped into the rest of us. Now, the second mission they were on, there was no refrigeration in Europe or right. anywhere else in the world. Preservation on food depends on certain herbs and spices and salt being one of the particular ones and different types of peppers and and cloves and so forth. Well, to get, they were bringing that from the East via what is now Turkey, Anatolia. The Muslims have cut off all of that route. They have no way to preserve their protein stock, their fish and their, their, their meat, unless they can get the salt and the other herbs that's coming from the east. So this is the second economic purpose for that mission. And then they bump into the rest of us. Columbus comes to America and open up this whole new land. Portuguese and and the Portugal and the Spanish have a contradiction over who should settle it. Right. The, I'm going to run a line right down here in Portugal. You take this part and Spain, Spain, you take this part. And the problem solved, but the Portuguese got the best of it. Mm-hmm. They got Brazil. Yeah, treated Tordesillas in uh, yeah. 1494, yes. Yeah. yeah. And so yep. now they found all this land because Europe is in an economic crisis. They're coming out of something called the bubonic plague, the Black mm-hmm. Death, where mm-hmm. nearly half of the European population died from a disease. They were in, because the Muslim had taken control of the of the Eastern Mediterranean, they had caused an economic crisis. So the market in Europe crashed. This is, um, what do they call it when the market crashed? The stock market crash or a depression. A recession. A recession or depression. depression. Mm -hmm. So there's a depression, there's a horrible disease that has killed half of your population. You're trying to get the hell out of there. So any ship going anywhere, I'm working on it, okay? Right. And so, When you understand this is the background of Europe, now coming into contact with the Congo and Angola. And then at the same time, the opening up of the lands in the West and Brazil particularly, and the needing for labor to work that land creates a whole dynamic that caused the Portugal to now begin to invade People weren't coming. So I got some black people we want to sell to you. We got some slaves here. Uh, We want to sell them to you. No. Uh, They became all kinds of strategies. And most of the strategy was met with the military might of the invading force who recognized early on we had no such military might. Right. You know, the military technology of Portugal was recognized very early on we have no gunpowder, we have no cannons, we have no muskets. We could not compete with their military. Even a small military of theirs could wipe out an army of thousands of ours with mm-hmm. those weaponry. And that's what begins this process. The need for labor in the West, the labor that's available in Africa that has no protection for herself, the need to create a healthy food um, production in Europe, 
because the bubonic plague had wiped out Europe, had decimated right. the people, the population. 1347 to 1400, it hits in spurts. Yes. yes. I do with that in my, my online classes I teach. Yes. Good. The Black Death. Yes. And so you factor all of this stuff in, because it wasn't just the Portuguese knocking on our door saying we want some slaves. There was something going on in the world. Correct. And and they bumped into us. Right. And the factors worked in their favor. And they had the weaponry and they had a war culture. They came out of a war culture. Europe is a war culture. Mm -hmm. It still is a war culture. And so this war culture meets this sedentary culture and there was nothing good coming from that because right. of the needs of the war culture. And so on the scene would come the family of Sister Nzenga, trying to navigate and negotiate this relationship with, with the Portuguese, even to the point of going, sending people to be trained in Christianity, thinking that would better the relationship, even right. to the point of having royalty trained by their priests in that theology thinking this would better the relationship. Well, that never happened. They used those uh, persons to indoctrinate the population into thinking they had a stake in this new system that was now being built. Who, who's the they? Who, who's the they? In, the, general, the chiefs primarily and the, the political structure in the area that is now being dominated by the potential of the Portuguese military invasion and those who are already who have already been invaded and is under Portuguese military control on the shorelines. Right. Because when you when you come into a country and take it over military, you subjugate those people. Exactly. And you can't say those people's actions are their own actions because they're not. They're right. subject actions, just like we here in America for 240 something years was in slavery. We didn't mm -hmm. do that voluntarily. Right. We did that under duress. Well, Correct. brothers and sisters in Africa didn't turn over their people voluntarily. Most of that was under duress from another military yes. conqueror. And then you have exactly. this young lady coming on the scene trying to figure out how do I mitigate this thing? Right. How, I still don't have an army that can defeat them. Though I have enough control over my population, we can defend ourselves and disrupt their operations, but we can't defeat them militarily. Mm -hmm. So then we're talking about the life of Nzinga, looking at the diplomacy, looking at African cultural response to European tyranny, looking at the way she handled. Let me give you a good example. Okay. And one of the stories they said when the Portuguese uh, leader came to meet with Queen Nzinga, they deliberately didn't put any chairs there because they wanted to belittle her and have her sit on the ground. Right, the governor, right. right. That's 1622, yes. Right. And they tried to demean her by saying she sat on the back of one of her slaves. That wasn't her slave. Right. That was her brother. That was his job. This is his king. This is the symbol of all of his ancestors because a king or a queen in Africa when they sit on the throne, they are the ancestors. When they're off of the throne, they are the king, the political leader. But when they sit on the throne, then they are the ancestors and they're the conduit for the ancestors. No one would let the ancestors sit on the ground. Mm -hmm. right? It was the duty of men and they kept exchanging places. It wasn't just one person, but the way they tell the history is that she was demeaning and subjugating this person. Right. Rather than understanding that our culture dictate that that's the behavior of the man. That is his responsibility to right. his queen. To his queen. And and, so, and, oh, go ahead. Go ahead and finish. Yeah. So it's understanding the nuance of culture and understanding that a culture, and when we talk Africa, we're talking about the women being the power. She is the power. And that power gives the authority to the male to run society. Right. And when the male has failed in that authority, that's when you see an Nzinga rise. That's when the king queen rise and take control of not just having the power, but take control of the authority of society. And that's Absolutely. what we look at. Absolutely. I'm gonna give some uh, briefly some historical background on Queen mm -hmm. Nzinga as well. 
because I know people come to these conversations with varying degrees of understanding a history and then not mm -hmm. understanding history then allows people to say ridiculous things like, oh, she was involved in the slave trade. She sold right. her people into slavery. Why does she convert to Christianity? Th things of this nature. Um, we've got uh, Jacqueline who's uh, watching the broadcast right now. She says, love the website. I will be sharing. Um, and she said also, thanks for the update as well. I think she was in my class earlier today. Uh, we've got um, uh, Beauty, uh, who's that? Beauty Kirk asked the question, uh, when will the series start? It starts It starts February 15th, 2023 on Netflix. Okay. And uh, Beauty also says, love it. She loves the conversation. Uh, Jacqueline said, wow, that's awesome. Uh, as well. And Jacqueline also said, thanks for the knowledge. Okay. Now uh, I want to uh, go here to, uh, so I looked at a number of different articles before uh, we came on mm -hmm. Professor Small to refresh my, uh, refresh my memory on uh, Queen and Zing. I, I, I deal with her in my presentation, Great African Women in History, The Mothers of Civilization. I talk about her some in uh, the online class that I teach uh, on Saturdays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. I had to teach a session of that class today. But this is a, a really good source that I use, blackpast.org, blackpast.org. We have a good synopsis here of, uh, of uh, Queen Nzinga. Uh, she lived from 1583 to uh, 1663, uh, number one. And this also depicts what you were just talking about. This is uh, took place in 1622 uh, when she met with the Portuguese governor, Jao Correa de Souza. OK, the sketch. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what you were just describing. Now, um, Quinn and Zinga uh, also uh, Bondi. The M is silent. Correct. In, uh, in, mm -hmm. in M is, yeah. Right. Yeah. Queen, Queen and Zinga uh, or in Jinga, as we see in the uh, documentary series, uh, the monarch of the uh, Bundu people as a resilient was a resilient leader who fought against the Portuguese and their expanding slave trade in central West Africa in Central Africa during the late 16th century. Uh, the French and the English threatened the Portuguese uh, near monopoly on uh, on the uh, sources of slaves along or, or african people the sources of african people uh along the west african coast who would they who they would enslave okay now because they didn't take slaves out of africa they took african people out of africa and right. enslaved them. uh now forcing it to seek new areas of exploitation so you have these conflicts between these european nations over who's going to control the, the 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 transatlantic slave trade um by 1580 common era 1580 ad they had already established a trading relationship with uh alfonso or king alfonso the first in the nearby congo kingdom mm. they then turned to angola south of the congo now this is what uh dr chancellor williams uh talks about in uh the book uh, this one right here, the destruction of black civilization. This is something that Dr. Chancellor Williams describes uh, in the book when he deals with the Portuguese going into uh, Congo. Okay, now uh, let me just uh, finish this finish this up very quickly here. The Portuguese established a fort and settlement at Luanda, which is which is now the capital of Angola, Luanda, mm -hmm. and um, they. Um, that was that was established in 1576. OK, um, the Portuguese established a fort. The, the, the Portuguese established a fort and settlement at Luanda in 1617, encroaching on uh, on Bundu land. In 1622, they invited uh, Nola Bondi to attend a conference there to end the hostilities with uh, the uh, Bundu. Uh, Bondi sent his sister in Zinga to represent him in a meeting with Portuguese governor uh, de Souza. And Zinga was aware of her uh, diplomatically awkward position. She knew of events in the Congo, which had led to Portuguese domination of the nominally independent nation. She also recognized, however, and this is something that you were talking about, Professor Small, and we see this 
relationship when different African kingdoms are trying to fight against these Europeans. And Zynga also recognized that to refuse the slave trade with the Portuguese or refuse trade with Portuguese, with the Portuguese, would remove a potential ally and the major source of guns for her own state. Talk about the precarious position that African kingdoms found themselves in or nations found themselves in and trying to get arms to fight against the Europeans and try to stave off the transatlantic slave trade. Right. During this same period following 1624, you had the British getting into the trade mm -hmm. and coming to Angola. You had the French coming to Angola to pressure the, the, the Portuguese. And so they're trying to find black allies in this coastal region and then using those allies to remove Nzinga. Now, there's a, there's a number of times when the Portuguese finance many of her enemies to yeah. attack her and arm those enemies. And so her thing was, can I get arms for my people? How, how do I balance this thing so right. that I can get arms to protect my kingdom? Because now it's no longer just the Portuguese, it's other European kingdoms setting up shore on our coastline. Right. It's not just the Europeans now. They're those of my people who have been, meaning other African kingdoms, who have now been uh, financed and militarily armed and trained by the Portuguese to fight against her and her kingdom. And so she's trying to be a diplomat in a way that she can have the necessary tools of war and have the necessary diplomacy and diplomatic agreements with the Portuguese that would keep her from getting wiped out by collaborators or by the new invading European forces. This is real throughout the history of the enslavement process in Africa. And even today, this is much of the same neocolonialist strategy that's going on in Africa. So, so go ahead, go ahead. So if you can understand the history and the life of uh, Nzinga, as she's trying to navigate European international politics, because that's going on right on her shores. Right. Uh, her own conflicts with other ethnic nations in Congo and parts of Angola, in terms of who's going to be the ruler, and those who desire to be ruler and would collaborate with the Portuguese for money and guns to remove an Nzinga and her kingdom. Right. So she's up against this in real time. In real exactly. Life. She's dealing with all these forces. She's dealing with Europeans yeah. and other African kingdoms that yes. are at odds with her as well. Okay. Right. And 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 when people make these nonsensical arguments, uninformed arguments, oh, Africans sold themselves into slavery. Oh, they, why did she convert to Christianity? All this stuff. Well, they they don't talk about them. the Christianity oh. piece. Um, yeah. People really don't understand. They really do. Um, Christianity is a theology that emanates out of the Nile Valley, Egypt. Okay, mm -hmm. Let's be clear. Mm -hmm. We understand what we call Christianity is a theology that emanates out of the culture of the Africans of the Nile Valley, not in just the Egypt. To the Egypt, you know, of today is half of the kingdom of yesterday. The Egypt of yesterday went all the way down to Ethiopia. What is Ethiopia? But Ethiopia did not exist then, the Ethiopia you know today. The Greek word, Ethiopia is a Greek word that was used for the whole continent of, of Black yes. people. Okay? So that we can be clear, sometimes we get confused. We don't understand the language well. Dr. King said, get the language right. And right. so Christianity was not right. a stranger to us because the Ethiopian church is a thousand years older than the Protestant Church of Europe. Get that in your head. Mm -hmm. So Christianity is not a stranger to the Congolese. It's not a stranger to the Angolan. They are interacting with the Sudan. The Sudan had more Christian churches than Ethiopia. Islam destroyed most of them, but they are doing the archaeological rebuilding for history's sake 
many of them today, like at Gondola and others, but these extraordinary cathedrals sat before there was a Catholic church. Okay. Right. So there is this heavy African Christian presence just east and northeast of Congo for hundreds of years before they met a Portuguese. Right. So when the Portuguese come, they're not, that's not something that is a stranger. They think they're dealing with the same person coming from Portugal that they're used to dealing with coming from Ethiopia or coming from Sudan or coming from a uh, Kemet. Because they're carrying the same symbol, the cross. The same symbols, carrying the the same same, symbol. pretty much the same story, mm -hmm. you know, of, of the Madonna child concept. Mm -hmm. This is known to Africans. They this, they weren't bamboozled by Christianity. Mm -hmm. They were trying to create diplomatic relationships with a nation that had come into this shore that was much more powerful than them militarily. And they were using the only thing they had in common. And what they had in common was this concept of divinity. Right. At least as far as, as, as um, what's the word? folklore, um, allegory, um, yeah, teaching all of these yeah. parables. Par this, allegory, this, thing known, this thing is known to them. Yeah, yeah. allegory, parables, hyperbole, yeah. how the Bible yeah. is, is They know about Christianity before they was a Portugal. Mm -hmm. okay. Portugal comes into being as a part of the Iberian state of the Moors and what? Uh, uh, the the, the 1300s, the late 1300s, when the Portuguese, and, and because they had been friendly and like cool, so black folks, okay, you let y'all have your little space. And they learn about Africa from these same Moorish sailors yes, who yes. had them under occupation. Mm -hmm. And remember, Moors, we simply referring to the African population that has become Islamized in Northern Africa, who had mm -hmm. invaded in the 800s, late 700s, and early 800 Spain and occupied it for 800 years. Yeah, going to seven. That's longer years. than white folks have been in the Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. But you can see the impact white folks have had in the Western Empire Hemisphere. Think of the impact black people had on the minds of the Portuguese and the Spanish. Right. So they took Christianity. They knew that's something that came to them from the East, Northeast Africa. They weren't crazy. Right. And our people recognize it, but did not recognize the new form, did not know the new form or the new cultural foundation it's now riding on or the military, the militarism of European culture, which is not a part of African culture. You know, we can talk about African warriors all you want. You go through history, you don't really see African military complexes until after they've been invaded by Northern military sources and then we had to get on it right and we did but we did not come from a genocidal military culture european is a genocidal military culture when it comes to diplomatic disputes being settled and you have to really have a clear understanding of that absolutely um i, I want to show this briefly here um i'm going to go back to this article here briefly and i'm so glad you talked about some of the history of christianity because largely african americans understanding that christianity is through the transatlantic slave trade and which is mythology mythology well, leron bennett cleans that up pretty good if we would study our history the shaping of black america or this is the book before the mayflower and the shaping of black america he deals with the fact so many of us was Christian when, when the enslavement of our people started. If you were found to be a Christian, they set you free. Right. And they found so many of us was Christian, they had to change that law. <laughs> <laughs> they also had a law that said those who were Turks, meaning Muslim, were set right. free. Well, they had to change that law too, because mm -hmm. most of us coming over, close to one fourth of us coming over, were already Christians or Muslims before we were captured in Africa and sold into slavery. Right, right. So uh, when you mm -hmm. study history, it'll get rid of some of the mystery and some of the crazy response we give to things. And you realize that the Christian church is an African phenomenon that got Europeanized 
and then weaponize against African peoples. And so we need to just take our stuff back, clean it up, and use it in the appropriate way. And if you really study Christianity in North America after the Civil War, that's exactly what Black people did with the church. We hmm. took the, the white church, we Africanize it, then weaponize it to fight for our freedom in America. Exactly. So don't, don't, don't get it twisted. Study well, history. Exactly. So would you say, I, I know one of my teachers, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, uh, hmm. has said this before, and, and you know Professor Kaba and you all will be together there in New York, uh, February 4th, uh, or the Hapi Black Day of Excellence, which we'll talk about here shortly. Um, he, he said that Christianity is an African religion or spiritual system, however you want to phrase it. Uh, we would say in its original form, maybe not 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 the white Christianity that's no, practiced would, today by Europeans. I would disagree with my brother just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Christianity contains the elements yes. of an African sacred science. Yes. So I've been saying for decades that Christianity, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are fragments from mm -hmm. the periphery of yep. the African spiritual system. Yeah. Um, but all of its elements and components are fundamentally African. Yes. But they have been Europeanized, European culturalized and then weaponize against African people. Right, right, exactly. That's why I tell people, don't throw away the Bible or the Helios Biblos, the sun book. We we can we can study the Helios Biblos. It's a the good Bible. reference book, but it's not right. sacred. It's right. not sacred. It's exactly. a reference book, but it's not a sacred book. But it leads you right back to ancient Africa because you're dealing with a retelling of a lot of ancient stories right. coming out of ancient Africa Kemet, Mesopotamia, different things right. like this. We just have to make sure we don't give it an authority it does not deserve. Right, right. Okay. I understand what you're saying. So we don't want to, if we want to be informed and instructed, then get informed and instructed by an indigenous African spiritual expression like mm -hmm. the Yoruba, the Akan, the Voodoo, right. ancient Kemet, ancient Ethiopian, and then frame out the Bible. Then you say, dang, they took all of this stuff Right. And their modernity, because their their experience with Christianity is a modern phenomenon. It's not an ancient phenomenon. And then mm -hmm. you can look back and see Ethiopia have a holiday. It celebrates on the 11th, I think, of September, their New Year. Right. It's the celebration of a Sar and a Set. It's the mm -hmm. celebration of the Madonna child and father. And when you go to Ethiopia, the first churches built there, Christian churches, were burned to the ground by the queen mothers because they said, this is not our culture. This is when it was being imported from the Byzantine Empire, which okay. is now Turkey. But at that time, Turkey is a black culture too. Mm -hmm. And But they were right on the borders with Europe. And so they had to create a system that allowed them to deal with having been conquered by the Romans and conquered before that by the Greeks. So how do we maintain our system and still live with these people? And so out of that evolution and trying to maintain an African spiritual integrity, but have a, a significant spiritual and theological relationship with the European came the birth of Christianity. And so when that was given to Ethiopia, Ethiopia re-Africanized it. Okay. Okay. So the Ethiopian church, when you look at it, you go like the Ethiopian Bible, the Ethiopian even have a book called the Ethiopian Book of the Dead. And so when you start reading these documents, you go like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Yet mm -hmm. you'll see all of the element of our contemporary Christianity as a part of the Ethiopian church as well. And so once you 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 take a look and realize, well, there's a church, when 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 they first built the churches, the reason you all heard of this one in Lalibela that's built down in the ground, the magnificent uh, St. George's Church, 11 church built cathedrals, built down in the ground, just carve out of stone into cathedrals. That was done because the king was hiding from the queen mothers, right? And he went up in the mountains, but it was only one entrance to get up that pass to get there. And he builds this new Jerusalem, which we now call Lalibela. But one of the churches that had been built in the greater Ethiopia, and I think it's in, um, um, Aksum um, oh. didn't get burned. It's called the Church of Miriam. Until this day, no women are allowed into that church. Right? 
because the women burnt, burnt all the churches down because they said this was an imposition. The way this is expressed is an imposition on the Aksumite um, culture, the African culture. Well, the, I went to that church once and um, I didn't have my camera, unfortunately, but I can go back anytime I want to go and I could see it. And the priest came to me with me and a young white man who did have a camera. And I said, if you take pictures for me, I will pay you for the photos. He agreed, oh yes, because he hadn't seen what we were going to see. None of the women on the trip could come into church and me and him was the only two males. So here right. we are. And the brother comes to me and says, I know why you're here. I go like, really? To myself. So I thought he wanted some money. So I reached in my pocket. I took a $20 bill and I remember wrapping it around my hand to be discreet and pass it to him. And he pushed it away and looked at me like with disdain in his face. And I felt like a puppy dog on the floor, right? So I slipped right. the money back in my pocket and go, oh my God, I just insulted that priest. I didn't mean to do that. Didn't know what to do. And he walks over to the corner. There was a tapestry about 20 feet long. 10, 15 feet wide. And he grabbed the tapestry at the bottom and started spinning it. I go, what is this man doing? Under the tapestry is the oldest painting of the Madonna and child in the world. Wow. And they're black as the ace of spade. Wow. And he just looked at me and I realized this man read me walking in when he said, I know why you're here. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking and I'm crying you know, because he just blew my mind. And the the white guy, he's taking pictures, but he never sent me one of them. He mm. never answered my letters, never. <laughs> he's just like, I'm not giving you this. Right. right. That it's church, true. the Church of Miriam stands today with that Madonna and child from the first Ethiopian church ever built before there was a Catholic church, before there was any Protestant church anywhere in Europe. What what, what year was that first Ethiopian church built? Mm. Or circa or approximately? Yeah, around the late second century, early third century. Okay, late second century, early third century, uh, AD, common era, AD? AD? Yeah, AD. AD. Okay. Yeah. All right. Wow. Um, that's fascinating. Okay. It, it, let me, let and me remember, we said all that to let you know that the people of the Congo and Angola, they're aware of this. This is their culture. Right. They're this aware of their culture. History. It's not foreign they're to them. They're interacting through trade with these peoples every day. Right. Centuries. With the Ethiopians. Yeah. The, the Ethiopians, Ethiopians, the Sudanese, the people who are now calling Sudan, the people of of Rwanda, Uganda, they're interacting with these people. Right. You know? So and when you interact with them, come with these symbols, they don't see a stranger. Mm -hmm. They see something they thought was a friendly agent that betrayed every thought and concept in their mind they held right. about Christianity at the time. Exactly. Exactly. Let, let me do this. I, I want to go back. Uh... I want to just go back quickly here to this article from blackpast.org, which gives a good synopsis of mm -hmm. uh, Queen of Zing Zinger to give everybody some background information. Okay, so we talked about how um, Nzinga uh, was challenged with getting guns to so that uh, those in her kingdom could protect themselves against Europeans as well as other um, African kingdoms who they were at odds with. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the first of a series of meetings, uh, Nzinga sought to establish her equality with the representative of the Portugal crown, noting that the only chair in the room belonged to Governor Correa. Uh, um, she immediately motioned to one of her assistants who fell on her knees, uh, who fell on her hands and knees and served as a chair for uh, Nzinga for the rest of the meeting. Despite the display, Nzinga made accommodations with the Portuguese. Uh, she converted to Christianity, as as, as you talked about. Uh, she converted to Christianity and adopted the name uh, Dona Ana de Souza. She was baptized in honor of the governor's wife, who also became her godmother. Shortly afterwards, Nzinga urged a reluctant Angola uh, 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 Bondi to order the conversion of his people to Christianity. So this was this is her brother. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Brother's still alive in 1626. So, and the brother's the king. Okay. In 1626, um, and Zynga became queen of the, uh, Bundu, uh, people when her brother committed suicide in the face of rising Portuguese demands for slave trade concessions, slave trade concessions. Professor Small, fill us in. What are these slave trade concessions? Well, the basic thing, which, which is true throughout slavery, was we want a certain amount of your people mm -hmm. captured and turned over to us. And the concession is we won't kill you. Right. They were called let's tripping. Come here, right? let's, tripping. let's be honest about what we're talking about. We right. will not destroy and decimate your kingdom in blood if you do this. Mm -hmm. We will stop the warfare and we will trade our manufactured goods that we bring to you, which was rum. And then Dr. Jeffries did a research years ago, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, and then in, in sampling um, the 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 research had found that the rum they were selling to African uh, people during that period was tainted with opium. Hmm. So we were being deliberately hooked right. on, on the rum, right? right. Um, but other finished products like hatchets and things you can use to chop trees that was made from the iron, uh, the early steel industry in Europe, um, certain food products they were bringing, certain cloth they were bringing, those right. kinds of things. But the main thing held over the heads was that we've got a military that can decimate and crush your kingdom if you don't make these concessions to us. Exactly. They had the they had the guns, and then Not they had just the guns, also. They had armies. Remember, they um, had the but, armies. Well, and there's yeah, something yeah. else that has taken place that took place in the Americas that destabilized destabilized our people that we never talk about: white diseases. Yes. Okay. So when they first come into our contact, we're losing thousands of people to the disease because they are diseased people. These are mm -hmm. people that didn't even take baths. Right. We're talking taking a thought taking a bath was evil. Mm -hmm. They knew nothing about soap and things like this. So they were just learning this from us with the Moors coming yeah. into the Iberian Peninsula. And and so and the Moors didn't go to train and teach them. That's another myth. Um, mm -hmm. There was a group of German, Germans, um, the um, oh goodness, um, the Germans who had invaded Spain. There, um, yeah, you had the uh, you had uh, Roderick, you had uh, the Vandals and the Visigoths. Yeah, the Visigoths. The Visigoths. They had also invaded North Africa. You mm -hmm. see, it, and 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 was undermining because they destroyed and was destroying and undermining the Roman Empire. The Roman is a group of white people who already invaded North Africa. The Visigoths are coming through Spain, the Germans and driving them out. Then the Africans under the Islamic leadership turns them around and drive them out and then drives right back into Spain. That's what we're doing. So that's why you got to understand history. We, we didn't just run across the, the Mediterranean. Right. So we don't have some fun to teach you how to bath, to teach you how to read. That's, that's myth. We were fighting right. for us, driving occupiers out of the land. And so... Right. The Portuguese uh, 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 are coming with a heavy military hand, but they're also very diseased people. Most people in Africa, in that part of Africa, never experienced the common cold virus, of which there's more than a thousand. And it would act on them the same way that um, this thing we have, this plague we have in America is acting on our, our lung right now, right. this virus mm -hmm. um, uh, the, that is called the pandemic. And right. so, up Wait a minute. God's save us. Then you appeal to the God of the victor. Re re repeat that. Repeat uh, that uh, last couple of sentences because you were uh, right. freezing up. Repeat that. Right. When we are looking at the numbers of our people that's dying from European diseases. Right. And, and we're appealing to our gods and our deities, and they don't mitigate this. So we're thinking that this other person's God is stronger than our God. Right. And common sense would make you think that. Mm -hmm. Not that you got an immunity to a virus about, that you don't have an immunity to that's killing thousands of your people. 
And we never factored that into the historical discussion about these invasions. That's true. Because this ends up shattering the infrastructure of our spiritual system because it can't protect us from this thing mm -hmm. that has come upon us. Right. Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. <laughs> I definitely they, understand it. They, more of us died from their diseases than from their weapons. Mm -hmm. And our priests and priestess had no response because we didn't have the understanding that this was a medical problem and not a spiritual problem. Right. Right. And so capitul there wasn't capitulation. Like, hell, if you're God that powerful, then I need to have a conversation with them too. I'm not going to sit back here dealing with this when you've already proven that you have a much more powerful God. There's a reason why she converts to uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. You know, because the cats who's being victorious is using that system and it's working for them. And my system is not working against them for me. Wisdom would tell me I need to adopt that system in order to try to defend myself. Right. Them. Right. Exactly. Uh, if you just go back and, and finish this uh, last uh, paragraph here. Uh, so um, in Zynga, however, refused to allow them, the Portuguese, to control her nation. In 1627, after forming alliances with former rival states, uh, she led her army against the Portuguese, initiating a 30-year war against them, against the Portuguese, initiating a 30-year war against the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. uh, she exploited European rivalry by forging an alliance with the Dutch who had conquered Luanda, which is now in Angola, which is the capital of Angola, Luanda. Um, the Dutch conquered Luanda in 1641. Uh, with, with their help, with the help of the Dutch, and Zynga defeated a Portuguese army in 1647. When the Dutch were in turn defeated by the Portuguese the following year in 1648 and withdrew from Central Africa, and Zynga continued her struggle against the Portuguese. Now in her 60s, she still personally led troops into battle. She also orchestrated guerrilla attacks on the Portuguese which would continue long after her death and inspire the ultimately successful 20th century armed resistance against the Portuguese that resulted in the independent uh, independence of Angola in 1975. It's called MPLA. MPLA. Yes. Despite repeated attempts by the Portuguese and their allies to capture or kill Queen Nzinga, she died peacefully in her 80s on December 17th, 1663. Um, so go, go ahead, go ahead, Professor Small, because I know yes, <laughs> I you want to comment well, on that. You know, I always say, Michael, and I got this from Dr. Nobles and I turned it into my little ditty. Right. History will erase the mystery. mystery. Yes. Okay. yes. History will erase the mystery. Sometimes, because I heard that a young man from Harvard had gone into attack against this film um, and saying, accusing really? our queen, I don't know his name, someone is sending it to me. Okay. Um, uh, of being uh, uh, an, an enslaver. And if, if you had Harvard University, that is supposed to be the premier university where research is done mm -hmm. and, and where intellectualism has an integrity. If you're there and you're saying this, I'm confused about the integrity of Harvard University itself. And why so many black intellectual collaborators uh, would see fit to go on the attack for years, decades, we are saying, we don't see our figures in the movies. We don't see our heroes and heroines in the movies. We don't see our historical characters in the movies. Young people like Jada, and her husband, Will, and others, um, Wesley Snipes, um, Forrest yep. Fulton, and others have been trying to do this. Uh, the young man in Atlanta. Um, Tyler was, Perry? Tyler Perry. You yes. can disagree with some of his stereotypical piece, but like Minister Farrakhan said, he never once portrayed my day, uh, my dear, as being other than a woman. You know what I'm saying? Even though he as a man is playing her, 
You ain't playing her as, as other than a woman. Everybody understand what I'm saying, right? right. <laughs> so you have to accept the brother's integrity. And we and when we see these presentations, how wonderful it is to get our children to see a story of Queen Nzinga or of the real Cleopatra or of mm -hmm. the other great queens that she, Sister Jada, is going to bring forward. And then the first person to attack them is the black historical intellectuals. What is wrong? You talking about a collaborator is not in Zynga, it's you. Right, right. In Zynga's yeah. history speaks for itself. Exactly. Not more extraordinary. How more extraordinary could they be? When her brother dies, she becomes also the king. Yes, the woman king. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've got to understand the woman is the power, the man is the authority. Africa has a spiritual integrity that she has been trying to defend from day one of the first invasions. Exactly. Um, yeah, when, when you get that information on this person. Uh, from I'll get Harvard, it to you as soon as I can. Yeah, yeah get, get that to me. See my goddaughter sent it to me. She said she was yeah, going yeah get, that, get that to me with a quickness. Uh, and then also just for future reference on this whole topic, we talked about this before when you and I discussed the Woman King uh, movie from Viola Davis and her husband. I'd encourage everybody to read this book by uh, Sylvian Dioff, Dr. Sylvian Dioff. She's a historian of the uh, African diaspora. Um, this book is called Fighting the Slave Trade, Fighting the Slave Trade, West African Strategies. And it goes through and it documents how uh, different ways that different African uh, uh, kingdoms, different African nations fought against the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, and, and some of it involved in, just like we talked about here and with Nzinga and, uh, uh, and Bondi, um, having to deal with Europeans saying either provide us with tributes or we're going to take you, we're going to kill you, et cetera. Uh, and just briefly here, it says, while most studies of the uh, slave trade focus on the volume of captives and on the ethnic groups and on the ethnic groups uh, on, and on their ethnic origins, I should say, the question of how the Africans organized their familiar, uh, familial and communal lives to resist and assail it, the transatlantic slave trade, has not received adequate attention. But our picture of the slave trade is incomplete without an examination of the ways in which men and women responded to the threat and reality of enslavement and deportation. Fighting the Slave Trade is the first book to explore in a systematic manner the strategies Africans used to protect and defend themselves and their communities from the onslaught of the Atlantic slave trade and how they assaulted it, how they attacked the Atlantic slave trade. Let me, give, let me give ahead. you a couple of instances. If okay. you were to go into Northern Ghana, mm -hmm. uh, to a place called Salaga, which was okay. one of the largest uh, slave markets run by Muslims, Islamic, mm -hmm. controlled by the Turks and the Arabs. Um, you will find in the surrounding villages <clears throat> homes that was you know walled in right. right 10 foot walls so that the enemy could not climb it and the houses had no windows it had a small door two feet high so you can get in the house the window was on the roof so you can get air and they just had slits in the walls to shoot their arrows out even the wall that surrounded the village the, the, the entryway was about two feet high. You stuck your head in there, you left it in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. These are just some of the defensive things that we that we did just in that one area. Um, the people talk about, oh, the Ashantis, they sold, uh, uh, they sold us into slavery. And the Ashantis, yeah, the Ashanti kingdom didn't come into being until the 1700s, late 1700s and mid 1700s. One of the greatest, one of the person who put one of the greatest defeat on the Portuguese and then in part on the Dutch was an Ashanti king named Bonsu, who Bonsu. marched the armies of the Ashantis to the shores 
of the Fanti and decimated Elmina Castle and drove them into the sea. Mm -hmm. After his army went into retreat back up into Kamasi, years later, they would return with an right. even greater military might. And then the right. Dutch would be followed by the British. But when you study the history and see the resistance, it is so beautiful. It, it just, it's just so beautiful. And it does, even with the Berlin Conference, remember slavery has just ended and they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we dominate Africa? Look right. at the resistance. 18, what? 1885, 84. 84. Yep. The very next year, they tried to take the Sudan. The Battle of Fahada, Fashada is one of the first one we need to study. The Battle of Fashada is an island on the bend of the Nile before you get to Khartoum. If you control that bend, you can control the entire uh, 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 river. So they lost because of a man named, an African named Muhammad Ahmed, who people refer to as the Mahdi. But Muhammad Ahmed in 1885, takes on the might of the British army in Eastern Africa, led by one of the most powerful and popular general in the UK named Gordon. Gordon came into uh, Khartoum, it's called the Battle of Khartoum, with okay. 30,000 men and left with 300. But Gordon didn't leave. Gordon left with uh, his head on a platter sent back to the Turkish Emirate in Egypt. So his Turkish troop and his British troops lay dead on the soil of Sudan. Okay, If we wow. go to the south and we look at General Setuweya, and, oh, goodness, when is Setuweya carries? It's in the 1800s. Rose Spear is the prime minister of Britain at the time. Everybody knows for some reason Rose Spear stepped down from the government, but nobody knows he stepped down from the government because in one day, under the leadership of Setuweya, General Setuweya of the Zulu, at a battle yeah. called Islambada, they slaughtered 2,000 British troops. And the British wow. people almost lost their mind. You talk about resistance? We resisted until we could not resist anymore. And it was exactly. the technology that broke the back of our resistance. And even then, the resistance didn't stop because coming into colonialism, you're dealing with the society of lepers, symbolized by what's behind me on my chair. Mm -hmm. This the of the fighters who was assassinating colonial leaders all over Africa. It wasn't until the coming of the Gatlin gun and the right. wholesale murder of tens of thousands of our people on any occasion that the Brotherhood backed up. You know, I need to learn. The, yeah, absolutely. The the Brotherhood of Leopards that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. I've I've come across information that draws a correlation or a parallel between the Brotherhood of Leopards or the Society of Leopards um, in like South Africa, in different African countries. Uh, they draw a correlation between that and Black Panther in Wakanda, who is the protector of Wakanda. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but- Yeah, well, you, you uh, can make that correlation and I've heard some people do it. I don't know whether that's really true, but it, you can make it ha it can make it look like that. What we had is a brotherhood. Okay. That is referred to today as the craft. The craft. Okay, yeah. It's like and a fraternal again, order. I don't know some brothers are listening and I want them to hear me well. Right, they right. They're responsible to their duties as they mm -hmm. hold their post. And if I give you the sign of fidelity, don't play with me because we have a responsibility. We haven't been meeting. So the craft mm -hmm. is a brotherhood that gave the West Freemasonry. Right, right. The Knights Templars and the, the Knights nice Hospitalis. Right. But that craft exists from the most northern part of Africa to the most southern part of Africa, from the most western part of Africa to the most eastern part of Africa, till this day. Yes. And 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 these are the teachings that are taking into taken into Europe by the Africans known the who teach Africa uh, into Europe and, and it's going to be these teachings that 
bring Europe out of the gauges. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and we know that, you know, 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. We know George Washington was a Freemason. We know that the Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol called a Tekken. Uh, and, and there are about 1,200 Tekken new all throughout uh, ancient, uh, ancient Kemet. Uh, there are less than 12 today. And they've been taken to different European countries and taken to New York City. Paris, Sydney, the UK, the US, Absolutely. Argentina. Yes. France. Yes. Stolen right. our culture. Stolen right. our culture. And, and then we look at these structures and think the people who have them today are so brilliant, such great architects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things like that. <laughs> they got it from us. <laughs> yeah. And and to come back to the lepers, because yes. every African community that you visit in Africa today have a society, even today, that deals with rights of passage for young men and the rights of passage for young women. Mm -hmm. It is out of these societies that come those types of brotherhood that have responsibility. Yes, colonialism and slavery have marginalized and minimized them. Right. But they still exist, waiting to be revitalized and raised up in many cases. In many cases, they're already in government trying to make their way all across the continent. The enemy knows this, and they're right. fighting against this. But you cannot win. Swapo taught you that in Namibia. You cannot win. You know, PIGC taught you that in Guinea-Bissau. You cannot win. MPLA taught you that in Angola. You cannot win. Ferlimo taught you that in Mozambique. You cannot win. When we fight back. Right. So you're saying when we fight back, we cannot win? They cannot win. Oh, they cannot win. I, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, we when we fight back, absolutely, the the, 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 the the opposition cannot win. Um, you, you know, you, you mentioned uh, uh, our esteemed scholar, grandmaster scholar, warrior, your friend, one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, and uh, I was look, going through uh, looking, trying to find the, the the Facebook post with the information here. So this is on Dr. J's uh, Facebook page. Uh, from December 29th, 2022, as many people know, um, he uh, went through heart surgery. He's recovering from heart surgery. You were just with him yesterday, uh, yes. correct, Professor Small. Um, and there's information. Uh, his, so his Facebook page is um, Leonard Jeffries Jr. Uh, Leonard Jeffries Jr. on Facebook. And they had uh, in this post here, they had information uh because he's in need of uh financial support okay uh please could please continue to keep him and dr ross and jeffries his wife in your prayers thoughts and libations i was told to let you know you can send contributions to dr leonard jeffries uh for, for dr leonard jeffries to walter d neely uh pc attorney trust account uh walter neely n-e-a-l-y uh comma pc uh, 100 South Van, uh, South Van Brunt Street, B R U N T, uh, Suite 2C, uh, in Inglewood, New Jersey, zero, uh, zip code 07631. We're going to, uh, get this up here on the uh, screen as well. So, because so what form do they want the uh, contributions in, Professor yeah. Small? To that account, this should be in check or money orders. And for those who want to use electronics, they can send it to PayPal at the email C S M A L L one nine two six at AOL dot com. C S M A L L one nine two six at AOL dot com. Right, and I'm gonna get that up on the screen also for uh, PayPal. Um, yeah, we'll get that up on the screen. Let me do this here. Let's get this one up. Okay, right there. Okay, so contributions for Dr. Leonard Jeffries to Walter D. Neely. Uh, that's uh, his attorney, yeah. uh, Walter D. Neely. Walter D. Neely, N-E-A-L-Y, uh, PC Attorney Trust Account. 
uh, Walter Neely PC 100 South Van Brunt Street, Suite 2C, Inglewood, New Jersey, zip code 07631. Okay, so uh, check a money order. And if you want to uh, support Dr. Leonard Jeffries through PayPal, uh, you can do so at uh, C Small. 1926 at aol.com that's for paypal contribution so dr uh, dr leonard jeffries has given us so much for over 50 years uh i would say now over 50 years he's 86 years old right professor small is 86 yes, he was okay. 86 on the 19th of january on the 19th, right 19th of january so we definitely need to come through and uh support dr leonard jeffries and okay. let people know he is recovering yes well. Um, for his age to have a surgery of that nature, um, but he was in good physical shape. But when you have that kind of surgery, replacing of a valve from the um, the big the big valve uh, mm -hmm. to the heart, but we were blessed in that the surgeon was a Nigerian surgeon, and his assistant was Ghanaian. You don't get no better than that in terms of blessings from the ancestors. Um, and he's walking, he's able to get in and out of bed on his well, walk himself to the bathroom and so forth. So he's recovering very well at a good pace. So we hope that he'll be home in his own home soon. And we just wanna make sure when he gets home, he doesn't have any medical bills. He doesn't have any other kind of bills to attend to. So right. some of the brothers from the Sons of Africa, myself being one of them included, have been doing what we could to work with his wife, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries, to make sure the home is prepared for him um, when he gets there. Absolutely. And we all right. So any assistance that you can give to our teacher, our Jagna, our master teacher, who have always sacrificed on our behalf. I've known him and worked with him for over fifty years. You know, yes, the five years to be exact. You know. Absolutely. All right. Um, so the Happy Day of Excellence is coming up um, February 4th, 2023 um, mm -hmm. in New York City. And you're going to be there. Uh, Professor Kabahai Watha Kamene is going to be there as well. You all are doing presentations. You got Infidushi Jahutimus. And it's Infidushi's birthday today, his Earth Day. Yes. David yes. Day. So we had a good time because another right. brother who I go back with for more than 40 years. Yes. Yeah. And I was invited on the broadcast. I couldn't get on the broadcast, the happy broadcast, because I was preparing to do this interview. So right. I couldn't jump on. I, I, I'll, I'll send him a I did get on and we had a good time. And he, he came out giving us a lecture on ancient history and spirituality. So <laughs> exactly. So uh, we have information for the uh, happy day of excellence on our uh, website the African History Network.com, the African History Network.com. So when you scroll down uh, the home page, you'll see information about my radio show, the African History Network show, Sundays 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9 10 a.m. WFDF, uh, here in Detroit. Uh, you'll see the um interview I did with Professor Jane Small back September 25th, 2022, dealing with the woman king and the real history of the. West African Kingdom of Dahomey and the original interview we did uh, that's been viewed over 50,000 times uh, on my YouTube channel, uh, Michael M. Hotel. Then we have information here dealing with the uh, Hapi uh, presents uh, the, um, a, a day of black excellence. This uh, So g give us a, a little information on this, uh, Professor Small, and your involvement in it. Right. Well, being a part of the happy family, I will be presenting, you know, I always do a mixture of economic politics, culture, and spirituality and how it all interrelates. But right. you will have Baba Kaba Kamane, you would have Baba Enfadishi, you will have Susan Taka from the Pan-African Daily Network, you will have Brother Harris, um, who's the head mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. National Business Associated Fellows by Booker T. Washington. He's just an extraordinary financial historian out of Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's, and so many others. We've got, I uh, uh, forgot the rap artist um, that was uh, there. Yeah, I'll pull it up here. Yep, you got uh, 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 hip hop artists. We'll get tied by this time of night. So, <laughs> yep, you got hip hop artists. Uh, 
the le- brand Nubian. You have brand, brand Nubian. Nubian. Performing. Yes. You have lyrical yes. faith performing as well. And uh, Jamal. Right. Mitchell. Yes. And there will be traditional African dances, dramas and dances and music. Um, and there'll be vendors that will be selling all aspects of our history and culture will be available for you to purchase for you, yourself, your children and your family. The idea when we talk about uh, black excellence and make no bones about it. We, we, we and happy don't allow ourselves to be defined by the 3% or the 5%. The media would like to define us by that 3% or 5% or maybe let's give them 10% of our people that they have in the prison system or in the drug involvement or in the shootings in the streets or in working with collaborators. Well, there's 90% of us that don't do nothing like that. Right. right. And they don't talk about all the children graduating from HBSU every year, right? Mm-hmm. Or all the black children graduating from every single white university in America every year, right? We don't have them discussed. Or all of the black people working in corporate America from Wall Street to, 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 to JP Morgan Chase running the all industry or the black people running most departments of the government of the United States, the majority of us, we don't hear about them, that own the whole suburban communities in multiple places of America, or still owning millions of acres of land in the South, and on and on I can go. Or that black business have been on the rise for the last 15 years without a decline. What's up? Right. What don't you tell us about them? Exactly. You know, you tried to create a niche and you create a music around that niche. Yes, hip hop is a beautiful gender, but when it's used against your people, like a dagger to rip them apart, it doesn't belong to us. It's the enemy's tool in black hands. Let's be clear, no disrespect. That mm-hmm. part of hip hop and, and, and that, that works to free our people, that do the social commentary to tell our story, don't just tell the story of the ghetto created by white people, Tell the story of the black communities created by black people. Tell the don't just tell the story of the unfortunate black family that fell to drugs, but tell the story of the fortunate black family who succeeded to send their children to law school, to medical school, to business school, or to be entrepreneurs in the community, or who became firemen or policemen, or who just opened neighborhood entrepreneurship on their own. Tell their stories too. The story of the ones that's fallen isn't the only story to be told in the black community. Right. We all get it. Exactly. Because the majority of us do not fit in your cultural drama that is dominated by the same white ethnic group that have been controlling the music industry when they killed Sam Cooke and killed Michael Jackson and killed Billie Holiday. Those are the same people controlling the industry you're in. You may be trying to get control of some aspect of it, but they still control it. We know who they are. Right. So stop playing. Tell the rest of our story. Tell the story of the other 90% whose story Mm -hmm. never get told. And so that's part of what we're going to do with the Conference on Black Excellence. We're going to tell the story of that 90% and that 10%. We're telling that 10%, we can lift you up out of the poverty that the society have put you in. So we're going to give you methodologies in which to do that. We're going to give you a history that can transform and inform you so that you can be in shape to change the trajectory of your life and your next generation. That's what being about the happy excellence that we're talking about. Economics is part of your pathway to freedom. It's not the only pathway. It's one of the pathways. You must be culturally uh, literate. You must be spiritually literate. You must be historically literate and you must be economically literate in order to be free. Food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security is what all of us buy for. And that means you must control economic politics and culture where you live. And that's what Happy is going to be talking about. True freedom is to be shackled to your identity. Because when you're shackled to your identity, you make sure you serve your identity economically first. You serve your identity socially first. You serve your identity politically first. And then you can serve others. Come back on. All right, sorry, I hit the wrong button. 
Okay, I hit the wrong button, closed out the browser. Okay, go okay, go ahead and continue, <laughs> Professor Small. Yeah, but that, that's it. The black excellence is about building the black community. It's nothing that was started by happy. This was started by the first African that stepped off of the first slave ship. Okay. And we haven't stopped since. It's just that in this time, in this space, Happy is one of the organizations trying to take not the lead, but a lead and helping us to look at black excellence from an economic perspective. And they're doing a very good job of it. And there'll be the happy film on economics will be shown. And also uh, the film by Amadeus Christ on, on heavy as the crown. Yep. Will also heavy be shown. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, we have the information around the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can purchase tickets, click on register here, and you can also uh, uh, live stream the event if you can't make it in person. You can watch from around the world. Happy presents a day of black excellence, a day of excellence in black culture through our creativity, intellectualism, and achievements in black entrepreneurship, our black genius. Um, so this is taking place at the uh, Jamaica Performing Arts Center, JPAC 153-10 uh, uh, Jamaica Avenue, Queens, New York. Zip code is uh, 11432. Uh, so you're going to have uh, Professor uh, Jane Small, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, uh, Professor Infidushi Jehutimus, uh, Dr. Susan Tata, Dr. Georgina Falu, uh, Riza Islam, Dr. Ken Harris from Detroit, and more. Uh, so you can purchase tickets. Everybody support this event. We had uh, Brother Taki on a couple weeks ago. Sister Felicia and, and Taki organized uh, this. So we have to definitely support them. Okay. So visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We have the information. Uh, right on the home page and you'll get to uh, there'll be vendors there. It's going to be a, a, a fantastic day. It's from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. OK, uh, lastly, Professor Small. Uh, and then also uh, when we're finished with Professor Small, everybody, I'm going to give you information about my online classes that are going on this weekend. We had a great class today. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. We had a free class session and I'm doing a class on Sunday from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1800 to 1968. That'll be a free class session as well. Um, Professor Small, very quickly. Um, Godfather of Harlem, season three started January 15th, 2023. You're the historical mm -hmm. consultant. This is my favorite show, Godfather of Harlem. Uh, what can we expect in uh, season three? Well, this is probably the best season, Michael, of, uh, of the three. Okay. Um, you know, with the first two seasons, it showed uh, Bumpy Johnson and the Black community working in alliance on different levels with Malcolm X and Adam Clayton Powell, Reverend Adam Clayton Powell, to try right. and wrestle the Black community back from the Italian mafia community. Yes. And this episode, we're going to see them trying to fight off the Latino, the Cuban mafia, which is underwritten by the CIA and the FBI to take over the numbers racket and the drug rackets in the black community in order to finance the overthrow of Fidel Castro. So you're gonna wow. see the image of Che Guevara, you're gonna see Che Guevara and Malcolm X together, you're going to mm -hmm. see an attempt by the CIA to assassinate Che Guevara and Malcolm, assassinated by Bumpy Johnson's people. You're going to see the FBI interloper who kills a critical element of Bumpy's thing ends up being killed himself. And then you're going to see the CIA finally, one of their leaders, dump off of a rooftop in Harlem. So we're saying, OK, it may be fiction, but it's so close to history you can't tell which is which. <laughs> and the final, the final episode is going to be the assassination of Malcolm X. Um, right. And so that was very sensitive to me on how that got done. Um, right. And so we didn't want to see Malcolm being shot anymore. Exactly. And exactly. so you will hear the shots, but you won't see him being shot. And you will see uh -huh. There's a little trick. I'm not going to give that away. That 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 that'll give you something extraordinary. And we're going to put emphasis on the other assassins. 
the ones in the back of the room who's throwing the smoke bombs that nobody talk about, the two of them, the two that had the fact, get your hands out of my pocket. Um, we're going to focus on the fact that there's these police agents in this room. Okay. We're, we're putting a heavy yeah. emphasis on the fact that the CIA and the FBI assassinated Malcolm X. Okay. Mm -hmm. And whatever role the nation had, they have to deal with that in their own consciousness. But where we've emphasized is the same history has the equation, the role of the American government in the assassination of Dr. King, Medgar Evers, Mount, and others. But certainly they have been left out of the role they played in the killing of Malcolm X. And we've tried to bring that to the surface and present it in a real way using the documents that we got from the government themselves. Right. So everything you will see can be backed up by research in the Freedom of Information Act on the very documents that they generated on how they pursued those men, pursued this young man, and how they sabotaged his movement. Mm -hmm. And eventually it is clear by their own actions that they are implicated in his murder. And so right. that will be there. And you have to wait to see the details of how we present it. But it's, um, are you going to love it? Oh, um, yeah. yeah. The, the, you know, the, you're going to love it. Because yes. the movie, remember, the, the, the Godfather of Harlem isn't just about a gangster named Bumpy Johnson. The mm -hmm. subtitle, it goes, when the African, when the black um, gangster underground meets right. the civil rights movement. Meets because the civil rights. Here you'll see the passing of the civil rights bill. You'll see President Johnson and Adam Clayton Powell arguing over these things. Um, you'll see a lot of history. Yes. So, and and where we embellish it or exaggerate it into the fiction element, it will all come from a base that is historically accurate that you can go out and research yourself. Absolutely. Uh, well, I, and I, I love the show. And um, just for people that don't know, Professor James Small taught for 15 years at City uh, uh, City College in, uh, of New York, including 13 years, well, City University of New York, including 13 years at the City College of New York's Black Studies Department, where he taught courses on Pan-Africanism, Malcolm X, and on comparative African religions, which included several African spiritual systems uh, titled African Religion and Survival, and two years at uh, New York City Technical College teaching the course of uh, African folklore and religion, both in the diaspora and in Africa. Now, um, he also had, he was also a principal bodyguard to the late Ella Collins, who was the sister of Malcolm X, and he was uh, the then the, uh, the president of the Organization of Afro-American Unity and was the uh, imam of Muslim Mosque, Inc., which was the religious organization that Malcolm founded when he left the nation of Islam as well. So this is why when you said, you know, that's really something personal for you, the assassination of Malcolm, things like that, that lets people know some insight into why it's so personal. I already know, I already know why it's personal to yeah, you. I met Malcolm in 1963 when I was 16 years old. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Now, uh, Professor Small, let people know how they can support you, how they can, uh, your, your cash app, your PayPal, whatever it is, how they can support you, how they can contact you uh, for lecture, to, to bring you in to do lectures, to speak, et cetera. How can people support you? Yeah. A cash app is now assigned Dr. James Small. Okay. Sign Dr. James Small. That's okay. Cash app. We'll get that up. Know to professorsmallafricanworld.com. That's where you can reach me for lectures on my PayPal page, professorsmallafricanworld.com. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. James Small on Cash App? Uh-huh. Okay, we'll get that up. Uh, Cash App is right here. Dr. James Small of uh, Cash App, you can support him there. And then uh, the website, what's the website? Uh, Professor Small African World. Okay, com. that's my PayPal page that I run everything across. Okay, Professor Small at African Not World. PayPal. That's my um, Facebook page. Yeah. So. Okay, Professor Small at uh, African World. That's on face. That's your Facebook yeah. page. Professor Small African World. Okay, Professor Small African World. 
uh, and that's on uh, Facebook, everybody. So, yeah, and uh, on Facebook, I'm James Small. Mm -hmm. I've actually three Facebook pages. I don't know why they keep them. Right, right. <laughs> so there's two of them. That's James Small. And there's mm -hmm. one called Sun Our Lodge, our business page. You know, we own a hotel in West Africa. Right. It's called Sana, S-A-N-A-A, -A -A, Lodge. So there's a Facebook page for Sana Lodge, which a lot of our work go through. Exactly. All right. So people reach out to Professor Small. He's one of our esteemed scholar warriors, uh, one of our elders as well. Reach out to him, support him also. And uh, brother, it's always good to uh, talk to you. Uh, till uh, Dr. Linda Jeffries uh, said uh, hello and uh, I will. I tell, will. Uh, keep up his spirits and everything. He still calls me a youngster. I'm 51 years old. He still calls yeah. me a youngster. So <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 one of our beautiful historians, uh, brother Michael. I love the way you teach history. Oh, um, thanks. <laughs> and, and so that's why the young people around the world, anytime you start saying anything somebody's gonna bring up there's two people they bring up brother mm -hmm. car and brother michael m hotel that's car great car. oh okay wow thank you i appreciate, that. I appreciate that and and everybody if you want to support the african history network because all this don't happen with no money it takes right. resources to do all this okay dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. You can also go to our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We have the information there. You can register for our online courses. Uh, my DVD lectures there and digital downloads are there as well. So that helps support us and help finance what we do, the African History Network. Okay, Professor Small. Well, look, brother, it's, it's good Michael. talking to you. And a peace yes, uh, hope to you and the family. You have a good night, okay? Peace and blessings. And to you and the family too, brother. All right, peace. All right. OK, everybody, that was uh, Professor uh, James Small, brilliant brother, brilliant scholar, one of my teachers. I've learned a lot from him. Uh, so a lot of my teaching style, I guess, comes from him also. Hey, I want to let you know, um, some of you have heard about the online classes that I teach. So we had a free session today of um, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. If you missed this class, you can visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can still register for this free session. It's on demand now. We did it live. It's on demand. I, I did it today, 2 p.m. Uh, 2 30 p.m. to 4 30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's why I was a little uh, that's why I had to push back this interview a half hour because it's already been a full day. I had to teach a two hour, uh, two hour class today. Uh, this is a 16 week online, uh, course. We deal with thousands of years of history and what, uh, leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, and we deal with the 800 year occupation also of Europe, uh, by the Africans known as the Moors. So some of the information that we talked about here uh in the interview with professor jane small we deal with some of that uh in the course but we get deep into this history i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips if you go to visit our website theafricanhistorynetwork.com scroll down the page you'll see it uh here 16 week uh online class ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade you can register for the full 16 week online course it's on sale 60 dollars regularly 130 dollars okay so it takes a lot of, of time and effort to teach these classes even though i've uh taught the been teaching the class since 2017 on and off the the cl class has expanded tremendously the amount of information that we cover has expanded tremendously um so it takes a a, a big effort to to teach this class and it's a lot of it's a uh it's time consuming there's a lot of work also but people are blown away by the content uh so you can register right here click right here to register for the full course uh the free class session is right here so you can uh register for that and watch that then on sunday uh january 22nd 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time uh i'm doing another session of a second online course that i teach called from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power uh 1865 to 1968 well we're doing really 1800 to 1968 and we look at this 168 uh year period of history and 
we this we look at what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place uh what had uh, sorry, what leads up to the civil war taking place uh we look at things like the missouri compromise of 1820 louisiana purchase of 1803 uh kansas nebraska act of 1854 uh bleeding kansas 1855 1859 uh treaty of guadalupe hidalgo of uh 1848 uh which is what ends the mexican-american war in the u.s gets colorado arizona new mexico california utah and nevada they get uh all that land from mexico okay uh so we look at what leads up to the civil war taking place we look at the reconstruction era jim crow era world war one world war ii great migration civil rights movement and black power movement so in our class on saturday january 22nd we're going to uh look at the uh, world war one and african-american men fighting in world war one and uh we'll look at the harlem hill fighters uh which was an african-american regiment in world war one and we'll look at the red summer of 1919 the red summer of 1919 where you had uh, uh about 25 major race riots all across this country okay and this was the year after world war one ended and a lot of these white men when they left uh to go fight in the war uh they had jobs but when they came back home those jobs were being filled by african-americans and immigrants were here and america exploded in racial tension because because of economic issues these white men cannot find jobs also at the same time this is during the period of time of the of the, the spanish flu pandemic of 1918 1919 and 1920. this is that same time period so you can register uh for uh, this online course we have the you, you can register for the free session claim your free session it's at our website theafricanhistorynetwork.com and then also uh, i'll post a link here for um the class for the free class session as well on sunday and if you miss the um class we did on saturday of ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade you can still register for that free class session but more importantly register for the entire course you can use this with your family you can use this with your children i would say the information is, is uh pg-13 okay it's not overly graphic or anything like that but uh i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips you'll never look at history uh the same way okay so we have the information we have the information posted here in the thread of the broadcast and in the description here and it's on our website uh the african history network.com now you you can we have a bundle pack where you can register for both courses both online courses for uh only a hundred dollars okay and that's a 260 dollar value because the class is uh, uh regularly 130 dollars each and remember we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded so once you register for the class you have access that doesn't expire so a year from now two years from now you can go back and watch the entire course so we have the uh bundle pack information here and just register uh you can just click uh let's see click here for the uh bundle okay so we have the bundle information right here on the home page all right look we have to get out of here remember uh at the african history network we focus on educating empowering and inspiring can you start a page can you start a page? okay all right uh, our show will be on sunday 9 p.m to 11 p.m eastern standard time the african history network show will, will be broadcasting on our social media pl platforms okay and uh be sure to support the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app and through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show this is our official cash app account okay uh and when you go to it it'll say michael and it may show my picture there um we have the information on the home page of our website the african history network.com and i had to uh create this graphic because some people set up fake african history network cash app accounts and they've been stealing money from us okay so this is our official cash app account dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w 
uh, and it'll say Michael. These other ones here are fake uh, cash app accounts. And there's like five that I've identified. I reached out to cash app months ago. Uh, it takes them forever to do investigations. They did launch an investigation. I'm still waiting to hear back from them. I followed up with them a few times. I'm still waiting to hear back from them. Okay. But if you click right here on the homepage of our website on the cash app link, it uh, comes up with the uh, QR code for us. All right. Okay. Look, we have to get out of here. Remember the African history network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent. Uh, and, and if you want to advertise with the African history network, I have to tell you this cause we're, um, starting to let people advertise with us again. We have, uh, uh, five advertising slots available in our broad in our rebroadcast of our shows and our radio show, things of this nature. If you want to advertise with the African history network, email us at a H N show at the African history network.com uh ahn show at the african history network.com our current promotion is buy one month get one month free so african-american business owners if you want to advertise with the african history network we take your 30 second and 60 second commercial we put into the rebroadcast of of our shows they broadcast on our social media platforms facebook and youtube but they're also in the audio podcast of our broadcast as well so we're on uh, about nine different audio podcast platforms, iHeartRadio, FM Player, TuneIn, uh, iTunes, CastBox, Stitcher, a number of different uh, audio podcast platforms, in addition to the social media platforms that we're on as well. Email us at ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com to advertise uh, with the uh, to advertise with the African History Network. Okay, right now it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever, and we'll talk to you next time. Peace.